Regarding leadership, we need to realize that there are two types of leaders. Those who were born leaders and those who worked so hard to become leaders. In the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they were always meant to be leaders, but they worked much more than others. If you're born into a family where sometimes they've already led, say in a business or in anything. When we talk of leadership, we're talking of all levels of leadership, starting from uh, leadership within the home and taking it beyond into an entire nation and perhaps even beyond that. So uh, sometimes you have people who are fortunate to have had this uh, life from the beginning where they were exposed to so many different factors and people because of leadership within the environment they were born into, their homes or sometimes th those whom they associated with. Whereas in the case of a lot of people of the globe who have become leaders, they were not necessarily born within such a uh, circle. They were not fortunate enough to have leaders within their homes. So they studied, they worked hard, but they had a vision. Someone somehow, somewhere happened to uh, perhaps encourage them, guide them, uh, be a role model for them that encouraged them to propel to that position. Focus was absolutely important. I find in my own life, I've had a father to look up to who's also a leader in his own right, a great role model. And I find that that was a gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To this day, I have a father figure. Alhamdulillah, he's still alive. He lives with me. He corrects me. And that's something I've learned to be a leader. Never shy away from being corrected. If you notice my life, I have over the years softened. I have perhaps learned that if you want to lead, you need to develop relationships with those whom you differ with. That is, that is actually one of my goals. Someone I really disagree with, I need to get along with him because the commonalities and the common factors are so great, yet they are ignored. It's something I've learned. And if you, if those of you who might have studied my life or who might have followed me for the last 20 years, perhaps, you will notice that in the last 10 years, you know, things have changed because we've learned what we did not know before. And you learn up to the point of death, but it's no good to just learn. If you're a leader, you implement the best of that learning, not just any of the learning, the best of it in a way that sometimes you might modify and perhaps uh, come up with some something that is greater than what you've actually learned to be able to teach it to others and there is no harm in fact we should be discussing it with people movers shakers I mean I like that term movers and shakers because when you discuss what is within your heart sincerely with those who are sincere you come up with new strategy you you arrive on a new level you come up with solutions and that's what makes you the leader that's what makes you a person who leads because you're different. I remember when I started, I took a lot of flack for some of the standpoints that I had. Uh, I can give you some simple examples, obviously, in my circle, where uh, using technology to its extent was at one stage considered taboo by, by some in my fraternity. But I never ever looked back. I took the flack and I carried on. And I recall there was a time when I too thought that perhaps, you know, it's taboo. I, I recall when Facebook actually uh, gave a platform to those who wanted to blaspheme the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. People were anti-Facebook, stop using it. You know, when YouTube had something, uh, a, a video against Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, people said, stop using YouTube. And initially, I had thought about it. I, I, I even spoke about it in one of my lectures. And very quickly, I had a businessman not even in my field, but he was a sincere brother. He came to me, he said, Sheikh, I think you're making a mistake. I said, well, what is it? And this goes back to leadership. A leader is supposed to listen very carefully to those who are sincere and genuine, no matter who they are. They could be off the street, in all honesty. They come, may come up with a bright idea that will change your life. So he says, you know, 
these are platforms. Have you studied them carefully? Do you know you can use them to counter exactly what you are trying to run away from right now? And I thought about it and I said, you know what? It's right. Subhanallah. And I started using it in a positive way. Bearing in mind that these platforms do not belong to Muslims. They belong to human beings. So you need to respect the others, those whom you differ with. And you need to try and present in such a way that you haven't compromised your position, but you've respected the position of the other. So as we grow and as we learn, we would actually be able to develop even beyond those who inspired us at times. When people say, I'd like my son to be like you. I say, no. In my field, I say, aim for the Sahaba. Aim for the companions. Who am I? I am a flawed individual. Perhaps you may be inspired. But if you aim for me, you know, you might get somewhere that is not a very good place. Aim higher so that you get somewhere, inshallah. May Allah make it easy. So the point I wanted to raise was uh, we need to uh, not blame uh, the environment we're in to say, well, he was a born leader. No, there are leaders and the majority of leaders have worked hard to become those leaders. And I think we all need to work very hard, be dedicated, focused, have, for example, role models, have people, mix with people who inspire you. I always say mix with positive people. And sometimes people say, well, you know, the negative ones, uh, if we mix with them, won't we, you know, who will be in, in the good and who will be in the, in, in the bad? Who is positive? Who is negative? If the negative people think, I want to mix with positive people and they're mixing with positive such that the positives begin to think they are negative, you never mix with each other. You never interact. So what you need to do, look at who is having an impact on who. And you will be able to tell whether it's the positive force that is winning or the negative one. Thank you so much. This brings me to major issues that is related to leadership in general. And this is a scientific uh, uh, study that we have done. Six issues related to leadership from what I've just mentioned. Number one, do not link leadership to knowledge. Do not link leadership to knowledge. MashaAllah, the brother uh, knows how to read the Quran in seven different ways. So what? This, the, I mean, this is, let him read the Quran in the masjid or on TV, but it, it doesn't lead. Oh, this sister, mashallah, she has a PhD in whatever. So what? I mean, this has nothing to do with leadership, huh? And so on. This is not a distinguishing factor in leadership. It is a unanimous agreement that Abu Dhar was more knowledgeable than Khalid ibn al-Walid and Amr ibn al-As. But they were leaders and he was not. Khalid ibn al-Walid, by the way, was one of the greatest leaders in Islam. Unanimous, huh? He did not memorize Juzu Amma. Put it, don't put it as a condition, huh? <laughs> Please. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, this has nothing to do with membership, with leadership. It has nothing to do with that. Come on, come on. Where, where, did, where did it come from? The Prophet ﷺ made him a leader immediately after his Islam because he was born leader. While Abu Dhar, the fifth person to embrace Islam, was not a leader. He, Abu Dhar was full of knowledge. Khalid ibn al-Walid had a problem. This is, this is in the hadith. Huh? He had a problem with Qul Ya Ayyuhal Kafirun. Whenever he recited it, he would make mistakes because it has repetitions. And, he, and because he was the leader of the army, he would lead the prayers whenever he is in the army and make mistakes in Qul Ya Ayyuhal Kafirun. And then he would turn to the people and say, Shagalani al-Jihad an al-Quran. I was busy, busy with jihad to memorize the Quran. So where did we get this idea of linking membership leadership with conditions of knowledge. We, th this is a major problem that we have in Ikhwan. Uh, to be in Shura, at least 15 
جزء of Quran. Ah, come on, what is it? I mean, where did it come from? Or ten, or five, or even one surah. Don't link leadership to knowledge. That's one. Number two. Do not link leadership to seniority. Number of years in membership. This came to Ikhwan from Iraq, from Egypt, when they were oppressed and they had to do a secret work. So because they were so scared of infiltration, they put it as a condition. But it has nothing to do with Islam or with leadership science. Huh? It's not scientific, it's not Islamic. The Prophet as I said, appointed Amr ibn al-As five months, only five months after his Islam as a leader. And by the way, in that is Salasil, he did so many strange things that Umar ibn al-Khattab did not accept. So he questioned that and objected to that. And Amr ibn al-As insisted on his way. So Umar ibn al-Khattab took it to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. He said, don't you see what Amr is doing? This is un-Islamic. What did Abu Bakr say? Very clear. He said, listen, Amr, I am sure that the Prophet وسلم, appointed him in this position because in this position he's better than you. <laughs> yeah, it's very simple. So he did not look at number of years. He never looked at number of years. Abu Dhar never took a leadership position. Never. And Khalid and Amr, only four or five months after their Islam. Only those who think in a secret system, think about infiltration, that think about number of years. <laughs> ah, we want to make sure nobody gets into the leadership until we're sure he's good, <laughs> sincere. How do you check sincerity? I, I don't know. I've been with the brother so many times. How do you check sincerity? And I, I assure you, all the major splits in Ikhwan and everywhere did not happen from the regular brothers, happened from leaders. <laughs> Always. That we check their tarbiya and we check their uh, number of years and so on. Huh? Everywhere. That happened in Tunisia, happened in Syria, happened everywhere. In Egypt, uh, everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Ah, you're no exception, of course. So, don't look at number of years. Number three. Do not link leadership to taqwa. It's not linked. Don't link leadership to taqwa. I mean, how do you check taqwa in the first place? Eh? <laughs> so, mashallah, this brother prays uh, Qiyamul Layl. The sister, mashallah, يعني, after each prayer, stays in the masjid half an hour. I hear it. Come on, is this taqwa? I know taqwa is in the heart. It is not in the actions. Taqwa ha huna. Wala is it ha huna. Sayyidina al-Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal was asked, أَنَغْزُوا مَعَ الْقَوِيِّ الْفَاجِرِ أَمْ مَعَ التَّقِيِّ الْضَعِيفِ Should we fight led by a strong person who has no taqwa or a weak person who has a lot of taqwa. And his answer was very clear. He said, At-taqiyu da'if taqwa li nafsa wa da'fa ala nas A person who has taqwa but weak. His taqwa is for himself while his weakness will affect his followers. والقوي الفاجر فجوره لنفسه وقوته للناس. Somebody who is strong but has no taqwa, his lack of taqwa will affect him personally. But his strength will benefit his followers. قاتلوا مع القوي الفاجر. Fight led by a person who is strong, although they have no taqwa. 
This applies not only to war. It applies to politics. Oh, this brother has no taqwa. We shouldn't take him. <laughs> Come on, brother. So this, is not, this is not a criteria. Who can win and benefit Islam more? That's the criteria. His personal life has nothing to do with it. This is between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm saying this because I've seen so many problems in the leadership understanding that made decisions because of lack of understanding of such issues. Number four, do not please link leadership with age. Don't put a condition, or oh, they must be 30 years or 40 years or whatever. I mean, look at how many conditions we have in our leadership. Huh? They have to be 10, 15 years members. They have to be this age. They have to be. Huh? And uh, I don't know whether you have these conditions of how many verses are uh, just of the Quran. Uh, come on, what, uh, what does this uh, to do? You, you add conditions that has nothing to do with Islam and has nothing to do with leadership science. So, Number four, do not link it to age. Let it be open. Age is not an issue. The Prophet ﷺ chose Usama ibn Zayd. Usama was 17 and a half. By the way, there are sayings that say he was 14, 15. That is not true. 17 and a half. Some Muslims objected because of his age. And the major objection came from Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. He objected. He said, Ammar alayna sabiyya. The Prophet sallallahu appointed a boy to lead us. These are the words of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. The Prophet sallallahu made a speech. This is in the last three days of his life sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he spoke about many issues. Among them this issue. He said, وَتَطْعَنُونَ فِي إِمْرَةِ أُسَامَةِ you object to the leadership of Usama. وَوَاللَّهِ إِنَّهُ لَخَلِيقٌ بِالْإِمَارَةِ كَمَا كَانَ أَبُوهُ خَلِيقًا لَهَا I swear by Allah, he was created to be a leader like his father was created to be a leader, Zayd ibn Haritha. And this hadith shows that leadership is born in some people. So don't link it to age, please. Number five. Don't link, link it to physical signs. MashaAllah, tall brother, well, uh, handsome. <laughs> and it has nothing to do with it. Uh, very clear, huh? Yeah. <laughs> like who? <laughs> See, there is an impression in... Some people say that, even in the Western world, but it is very clear in Arabic. That the shorter you are, the more clever you are. <laughs> they say it in a very bad way. They said the closer you are to the ground, the more deceptive you are. <laughs> deceptive, yeah. <laughs> So again, yeah, this is very clear. Ahmed Yasin is a leader. He was crippled. I met him so many, many times. Only his, only his head moves. Nothing else. Yes, Ahmed Yasin, the founder of Hamas. And he was a leader. Lastly, do not link leadership to sex or gender. Men are better leaders than women, etc. That's not true. We did a scientific study on that and an Islamic study on that. And both results show very clearly that this is not true. The sisters will treat you for Ah, of course, of course, of course. Let me mention a few things related to this. It is proven scientifically that women have certain characteristics that helps them in their leadership more than men. For example, women are more creative than men by 25%. <laughs> so if you have a problem, 
that needs a creative solution, not a regular solution. You, if you give it to a group of men and a random group of women, women will come up with more creative answers and solutions by 25% more than men. This is one. The second thing, women, and this is very strange, but it's proven today, look further in future than men. So it is strange, but it is proven today. Yeah, they, they look further, especially, by the way, in issues of terbia of children and so on. Uh, don't do this. Uh, this will affect him in the future, etc. But it also applies to everything in life. The unfortunate thing is that they are so busy with small things that they don't plan enough. <laughs> but if they planned, wallahi, men have no hope. Yani. <laughs> 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 but they don't plan enough. They are so busy with the small things. See, I, when I, I give this in Kuwait. See, when I, when I am invited to a marriage ceremony, I think, what should I dress? White or white? <laughs> we dress anything. We go five minutes. We're done. With the ladies take five hours to get ready and six hours in the ceremony itself. And... It's so busy, huh? So busy and cooking, etc. And so, but if they plan, wallahi, wallahi, and inna kaidahunna azim. So, so this is also proven. It is also proven that women like to consult more than men. <laughs> A strong yes from there, yes. <laughs> and this is in the Quran. In the story of Sulaiman alayhi salam with the king, queen of Sheba, Balqis, she says, "Ma kuntu qati'atan amran hatta tashhadun." I will not decide on any issue until I consult you. While men would say, "Nahmi ulu quwa wa ulu baasin shadid wal amru ilayki fafali ma taamuri." We are strong and mighty. It is up to you. You decide. So she is asking for consultation, and they are telling her, become a dictator. <laughs> and this is, this is proven scientifically today. Unfortunately, women lack one major thing, which is so important, and that really hurts their leadership. And that is decisiveness. Which means that an issue has been studied, all the information has been collected, we're ready to make a decision, Men will make a decision. Women will hesitate. This is proven today. So they need to work on that. Which means that if, if, if she says, let's wait, it must have a reason. Women say, let's wait without a reason. And that's even in issues of life. So if you're waiting for more information, still not, I mean, you're expecting it. It's not only... But she expects something that is vague, and she does not decide. So these are some of the different characteristics. But quickly also, on the issue of consulting, it is proven that when a woman leads men, she consults. When a woman leads a group of men and women, she consults. When a woman leads only women, she becomes a dictator. <laughs> So it is wrong to keep women in a section by themselves. <laughs> really. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh everyone. Welcome to Amazed by the Quran, a series in which I love sharing with you guys things I find amazing about the Quran. And today, something beautiful about our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah tells him in Surah Al-Shura wa sha'wadhum fil amr. Consult them in decision making. Consult them in decision making. Actually, this is in Surah Ali Imran. When Allah says, وَشَعْبِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ He says, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ It's by the incredible mercy and loving care of Allah that you, meaning the Prophet, happen to be lenient towards them, meaning the companions. وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ فَضًّا غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ Had you been tough, in hard-hearted, لَنْ فَضُّوا مِنْ حَوْلِكَ They would have dispersed away from you. فَعْفُ عَنْهُمْ Then pardon them. وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ And ask Allah to forgive them. وَشَعْبِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ and consult them in decision making. Okay. In this ayah, this by the way happened after Uhud. 
Uhud was a time where 70 great co companions were killed. And including among them is the beloved uncle of the Prophet Hamza, whose body was mutilated. And what this terrible catastrophe happened as a result of some of the Muslims leaving their post, leaving their sniper archer post. That strategic decision, and the Prophet said, don't leave it. A long story short, he said, don't leave it, and they still left it. They misinterpreted his instruction and they left it. So they messed up in a sense. So obviously he's upset. And the ayah comes down, it is by the special loving care of Allah that you're lenient towards them. Had you been tough, hard-hearted, they would have dispersed away from you. So pardon them. Even if he pardons them, they messed up. The guilt of ha costing 70 lives is not a small thing. The guilt of costing the Prophet ﷺ, the, his beloved uncle, is not a small amount of guilt. So even if he says he forgives you, you're not going to feel like you're forgiven. You're not going to feel like, oh, it's all, it's, oh, we're back to normal now. It's all good. You know, we are like we always were. The scar is going to be there. So Allah says, وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ And ask Allah to forgive them. Shh, demonstrate to them that you are praying for them too. They'll give them some relief. But then even then they'll feel like, okay, so he ceremonially prayed for us. And of course, he's the Prophet. He will pray for us. He's so merciful. But I still feel so much guilt. I don't think my relationship with him will ever be the same after messing up this badly. So Allah adds, وَشَاوِرْ هُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ Consult them in decision making. When someone feels like it's not the same anymore, obviously they're not going to, the Prophet's not going to find an excuse to talk to this person. If they come and talk, he'll be cordial with them. But he's not going to go out of his way to continue communication because there is a scar. And Allah says, don't let that scar be there. Go and seek their consultation when you make the next decision. Why would you seek the consultation of someone who just messed up? Like think about that. And yet this is the leadership of our Prophet being taught by Allah. Our Prophet ﷺ that you as a leader, the most important thing to you is not the obedience of your following. The most important thing is the love of your following. They must love you and they must know that you love them. And if there's anything that can put a dent in that, you must remove it. So when you go to the one who messed up and for the next big decision, come call them over and say, hey, what do you think? I need your opinion. The shock that they will get, wait, you want my opinion? I just, okay they will have more love and respect and conviction that there is no scar left. They won't think in their heart there's any scar left now. You have cleansed their heart of that assumption just by taking their consultation. It's so beautiful. It's so, and it's not an easy thing to do. But what a profound lesson in leadership. One more thing here. The Prophet ﷺ doesn't need consultation. He gets consultation from Allah, delivered directly by the angel Jibreel. <laughs> So technically, he can make whatever decision he wants. He doesn't speak out of whim. It's revelation that's been revealed to him. That's how he speaks. Additionally, Allah Azza wa Jal says, If he started following you in most decision makings, all of you would be harmed. Follow him instead of having him follow you. But yet in this ayah, Allah says, take their decision, take their consultation. No one is more senior to the Prophet ﷺ in understanding the religion. No one, no one is wiser in the company of the Prophet ﷺ. No one's more knowledgeable, no one's more aware. And yet Allah says, seek consultation. And you know what? I'll share one, one quick story with you. One of the most difficult times in the life of the Prophet ﷺ is when his wife was accused of wrongdoing, Aisha. The entire Ummah was taken by strong. People were talking left and right, accusing Aisha ﷺ. A rumor had spread about her. Uh, that, that she had, you know, been, uh, you know, she had committed infidelity. And when this scandal got so overwhelming for the Prophet and she actually didn't realize, she happened to have gotten sick. She had gotten sick. And she had no idea this was happening outside. No clue. And she was sick for almost a month. And the Prophet would come over, and usually he'd come over and he'd tend to her and care for her, but he was so much in pain about all the things that were being said. They would come and just talk to her briefly, and then just say, Kay fatikum, how is this one of yours? He'd say, ask the servants, she's doing okay, and he would leave. And she noticed he's being a little bit distant. Something's bothering him. He's not the way he always was, right? And then she eventually found out what happened, and she was just in complete disaster. She cried like days in a row. She cried days and days in a row. She almost like on the, to the verge of death. And then, it's incredible, 
The Prophet ﷺ needs counsel. He needs to hear somebody's advice. So he calls some of the youngest people in his company. He sought the opinion of Usama radiallahu anhu. He sought the opinion of Ali radiallahu anhu. What do you think about what I should do in terms of my marriage? Do you know how young Ali is to the Prophet ﷺ? How young Usama is? Like, they're kids compared to the Prophet ﷺ. When the Prophet announced his prophecy, and him being a Prophet, Ali was like eight or nine years old. He was a kid. And now this kid is being sought for his advice in one of the toughest times of the Prophet's life. What am I trying to get across? When our, our Prophet himself is being told, seek their consultation, then sometimes you should not underestimate the value of an outside opinion, no matter how much less qualified than you, you think they are. If the Prophet himself is not beyond it, you and I aren't. We can use the advice. We shouldn't underestimate where the advice comes from. We should not underestimate where it comes from. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us people that are humble to advice and are able to embody this beautiful, beautiful legacy of our great messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that is recorded so incredibly in the Quran. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. If you enjoyed this video, please do share it with friends and family. If you want to see more videos from this series, click on the box at the top. If you want to see other videos, click on the box at the bottom. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Thanks.